And we're live. Another edition of the Johnny and Jean Show. I'm Felix Devine. To my right, John Eli, and our guest today, Victor. Victor, uh, thank you for being in the studio. My pleasure. So before we get into it today, uh, just a quick reminder to everyone watching or listening out there to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button and our Patreon, which has all our content early, bonus content, Q&As, and the ability to ask John and Gene uh, personalized questions. We also want to give a big shout out to KCL Automotive, and uh, John will talk to you about them in a second. I'll give you the phone number at the end. KCL Automotive is uh, full uh, auto repairs, inspections, tires, body work, specializing in body work, actually, and uh, buy here, pay here, use cars, any need you have, uh, please contact my cousin Steve, Chris, or Dave at the uh, East Stroudsburg 98, Henry Street, East Stroudsburg, PA. Thank you. And the phone number is 570-534-8497. We also want to give a big shout out to Dr. Kramer at Cannabis Exam NY. Dot com. Medical marijuana is now legal in New York State, which means you can now go to www.cannabisexamny.com to start the process on getting your New York medical marijuana card. Here are some of the many qualifying conditions one can have in order to be eligible to obtain their medical marijuana license in the state of New York. Conditions include chronic pain, arthritis, ALS, PTSD, epilepsy, cancer, HIV, no cancer, no, uh, no, <laughs> no. Again, go to CannabisExamNY.com today to get your New York medical marijuana card and schedule your exam with a New York licensed physician. Get 100% refund if you don't qualify. We'll put the link in the description of this video. So go check it out today. So, Victor, um, we're happy to have you here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, I believe that uh, you have a, a good friend that we're going to talk about in uh, in Tommy Karate, and uh, we'll we'll kind of break that down and and you know I guess start off with your relationship and and how you know him. Tommy Guns, Tommy Karate, to me, T. We had our own little uh, tag between each other. He called me the mayor, and he called me uh, the big V, the big guy. Yeah, we were very close. When did you guys first become friends, or how did that? Um... Well. Let's take it from the beginning, John. The beginning was about 1978. And I want to make this, uh, your audience aware of something. I have never, in the last 41 years, have ever done a show anything about Tommy or spoke to anybody about Tommy or our relationship. It was very special to me. We were very close. People may not believe this. But we were like brothers, and there was a side, a very warm side to Tommy. Well, that's the side that, you know, you know, because I talk to him as, uh, or about him, sometimes not favorable. And, and you know, on a, you know, you want the public to understand there's a human side of somebody. And sometimes we meet each other as enemies or, or just associates of knowing each other from street business, from, unfortunately, murder and crime. And you know him in a different way. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted you here, to humanize him and tell a side of, that you know him and, and, and a good side of him. Well, I'm going to tell the audience and you, John, <clears throat> honestly, what he was about. I knew him in the beginning. We were both 25. And you knew him from a, 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 that world perspective, of that kind of world. Right. I knew him from that but I knew him from a personal relationship. I mean, we sat on a bed and talked about good and evil together. Who could say that about that with Tommy? Right. No one. I was out one night. You know, the 70s and 80s was big club time. There was a lot of clubs out there. Right. And everybody having a good time. We didn't worry about COVID. We didn't worry about this, worry about that. We were just out there. Street guys. Regular guys. And you, everybody at that time, you got into a different bunch if you were italian or you were around those kind of people you know around guys in the business world you all had relationships in brooklyn i'm talking about brooklyn now i'm not even gonna go to the other boroughs right. talking about brooklyn and honestly speaking you need to have a friend and you need to be group because more than one you'll have a bond you have strength right Oh, especially in those days. Right? In those days. Okay. Today it's a little different because the words are not good. The handshakes aren't so good. And guys just don't have the, 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 the guts <laughs> that they used to have in the sense that they're stand-up guys. What do I mean by a stand-up guy, John? A guy that keeps his word and keeps his handshake. If you find that today, and you got a friend that'll stand for you in bad times, 
you're a lucky guy. Yeah. Tommy was that kind of guy. I don't want to know about anything about all the bad things that he, people talk about him, how he was. That's between him and God, not for me to get involved with. But I know my relationship with the guy, and me, he treated like a brother. We met at the bar in a discotheque called Le Farfal. I remember John like it was yesterday. We was, it was a, you couldn't move in the place. Remember how the clubs were packed? Yeah, sure. You had drinks by you. He wanted, Tommy always wanted to buy me drinks. He was a great guy that way. So we would be standing there together, and Tommy uh, was a very conversed guy. He loved to talk. He loved politics. He loved to socialize. He was shy, and he was quiet. But if he liked you, he opened up like a can of worms. He would talk to you. He was, he was the greatest guy. He had a very nice dimension to him. See, you saw him in that light where you had adversaries. Well, I had, you know, for the people that don't know, there's a book out called The Butcher about Tommy Pateri. That's his last name for the people who know. We call him Tommy Karate. And I was involved in him uh, in a different aspect, just like you said. Mm -hmm. and, and today, this is the side that I want people to understand. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could have been that guy with a relationship with Tommy if I would have met him with you at a different time. And I want that's what I want people to see a different perspective of who that Tommy is, the nice guy Tommy. John, you're on it. Yeah. If from my perspective, I'm very good with people. I studied psychology in college, and naturally from the street, I'm wise. You would have been best friends with him. Yeah. If you knew him from a different plateau. Right. Because I knew him from the beginning, I know about him. But teams start to form, things happen in that. Yeah. Sandra. But when I knew him, we knew him like, you know, neighborhood guys. We were like young brothers, you know. I mean, I sat on his bed with him. And we talked about good and evil. Um, things happened, and we talked about this and that, and I'll get into that later. But getting back to the beginning, we met in the club, and we started to really talk to each other. We exchanged phone numbers, right? Then we took a piece of paper and wrote it down. Remember those days? Yeah. There was no cell phones. Yeah, well, luckily we had beepers. We didn't yeah, have beepers yeah, yet. Yeah. yeah. It was the 70s. But anyway, uh, a lot of people don't know this. But Tommy wasn't with the Bonanno family. That's not where he started. He started with the Colombo family. Yeah. That's where he started. A lot of, some people know, but some people yeah. don't know. But that's where he began. And um, Tommy, uh, there was also a lot of other guys there that, well, that I could mention, but I'd rather not. And at the same time, um, I do remember I was there and... Uh, and the club, and Tony Sirico was there, too. Remember Tony Sirico from sure. The Sopranos? Yeah, yeah. A stellar guy, a good friend of mine at the time, a good guy. That's all I could tell you about Tony Stella. He's from Canarsie, Brooklyn. He was partying there that night. And uh, he I don't know if anybody knows this, but him and his brother were known as the two toughest guys in Canarsie, the Sirico brothers. Really? I didn't realize. Very, know. very tough guy physically. Yeah. Very tough. But for me personally, my relationship with him, great guy. Stand-up guy. I remember I was in the club with him, and you know, I started to meet him for the first time through another friend of mine. And he said to me, Victor, I don't know why. Why I like you, but I like you. And I took that as a compliment from him, because he was a guy, his few words. Right. And that character that you see on the on Sopranos, that's him. Yeah. That's exactly what he's like. But getting back to Tommy, that's how we met. And then at what point did your, your relationship kind of blossom? From that and... moment, it blossomed 100%. We been to hang out together. We started going clubbing together. We began to talk a lot. We would get together. Uh, I'd pick him up. He'd come and get me. Um, he, he knew me since I lived in Flatlands, Brooklyn. And that's where I grew up. I grew up around every I at East 52nd Street in Brooklyn. Um, I went to Midwood High School. I went to St. Joseph's College, but that's the area that that I've been. Tommy was down from the West Streets. We used to always go down there, hang out, the this and that. Remember the club? Sure. The wrong number. That was Tommy's Tommy Zandra over there. And uh, I got so close with them. I was in the house. With the, I know the parents well. Very close with uh, the, Kathy. The and, Bay Club. You remember the Bay Club? We Brooks hung out. At, Bobby, that was Brooks, Brooks, Bobby, Brooks. Bobby. Bobby Brooks was a very personal friend yeah, of mine. Yeah, he was a friend of mine too. Yeah. I, I actually I did time with his son too. I was very, I was very lucky. Oh, did you? Yeah, ninety six. Eleven years he did the son. I believe. Yeah, the son's a, a good shape. St yeah. Stand up guy. Yeah, he's a tough little guy. You know, he's uh, he had a problem with a guy that I ended up jumping in for him, and not that he wanted me to, but I did, and. Uh, 
you know, so. You're a good but, guy. Yeah, he was a good guy, Bob. No, so you were a good guy. Yeah, well, you know, his father was my friend. We all hung out there back then. Was, Bobby. You know, Jimmy Burke and, you know. Jimmy Michael Burke. Burke you know. Bobby. I loved Bobby. Yeah. Bobby was so like this with me. I was in the insurance business for many years. I got to can I tell you a quick sure. story. So being in the insurance business at the time was very competitive with the auto industry, doing auto insurance. So <laughs> there was a time when there was a, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but it was not insurance, but it was like a service company that came out to give you more competitive rates. So we all use this. All the brokers through New York State used this. And what happened was the insurance company, the insurance department ruled against them. So I had a million customers in this thing for comp and collision. Right. <laughs> so one day they closed the doors down on them and they couldn't fix any cars and they wouldn't let them. They closed the place down. Bobby had three cars there with me. <laughs> Bobby couldn't get his cars fixed. It was it was the Bobby. I used to talk to Bobby he, every morning. So prison. so wait so wait you got to hear the story, John. It's too funny. I used to call him. So Bobby, Bobby says to me, Vic, finally says, Vic, where's the cars? I'll just pick up the cars and I'll get take them and get them fixed. That's the kind of guy, if you had a relationship with him, he didn't care about the money. He didn't care about the problem. They were fixed eventually. I got it done for him with the company. But he's a stand-up guy. Yeah. And how I got close with Bobby, his nephew was riding a motorcycle in Mill Basin in front of my house. No license, no nothing. The kid skids, goes under the car and gets semi-hurt. And the bike was laying in there, and somebody calls the cops. I says, come on, let's get the bike, get it out of here. We'll put it in my backyard. I lived in Mill Basin. We put it in the back of my house. The police came. They said, where's I said, the kid was there. He took off. I don't want to get the kid in trouble. Right. Bobby came. We cemented a relationship that never ended. Well, actually, the guy that Bobby Brooks had the problem with was uh, Louis Arricchio. And for people that don't know, Lou, Louis just passed away. He died. Uh, he was sick from my own stand of COVID. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I want to give my uh, condolences to him, his family, his daughters. And Louis, you know, again, it was a guy that was a friend of mine, ended up becoming somewhat of an enemy of mine. But he was a tough guy, strong guy. He was in for, uh, I believe, accused of two murders of one of them, John DeGilio, on the waterfronts. Uh, he had a fight with Jackie DeNorcio, the Jersey gang. Jackie passed away since. Then he had a problem with Bobby. And that's when I jumped in. And then things happen. And again, like Tommy, there's things happen in this world. Right. You know, you, you, you're on a certain team. Bobby Brooks's father was friends with ours. I got messages. And, and you know, and, and again with Louie, you know, I hate to talk about somebody that passed away. So in a negative way, there was a lot of good qualities about Louie. And so, you know, when people say, well, you know, no, I respect, I always say the same thing. I'll respect my enemies. And, uh, he was a tough guy, Louie. Louie was a serious guy, too. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, guys meet in the wrong circumstances, and this is what goes on in this world. Right. And, you know, when a guy like this just passed away, you know, he's a fairly young guy in great shape, and it's a shame. So, you know, for his family that to talk, and I, you know, I, I want to say something positive about him, not negative. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we lived the wrong life, the wrong path, and a lot of us would have been good friends if we met in a different way, and that's a lot what my show's about. Talking about kids understanding, respecting each other, and mm -hmm. understanding this life is so dangerous and treacherous that, uh, you know, guys meet the wrong way and you lose your life. The way I see it is this way, John. There's going to be adversaries no matter how you look at it. But the dividing factor, what I look for, is what kind of guy the guy is. Is the guy a stand-up guy? Is the guy word good? Can I shake his hand and trust him? Because you can't find that. Yeah. If you got that, if my adversary is that, I'm going to respect them. But you got to do, you know, whatever you have to do. But at the same time, in choosing your relationships, that's the key. Who you're around. And, you so know, I picked and choose who I wanted right. to be around. Now, with Tommy, I was young, you know. And I'm not sorry if I had to live my life over again, I'd do it again. Because whatever his actions were, that's his business and God and between him and God. That's not my business. But I know my relationship with him was honorable. He would never hurt me. We were like brothers, and that's hard to say about Tom. Well, did people And I would never hurt him. At the time, did he have the reputation of being a, a, a oh, he had a madman, a dog? Oh, oh he was you he was, know, wild dog. They would he was say, halfway you know. there. Okay, so and you didn't have no, you know, on a personal relationship, people say that. To myself or other people, well, weren't you intimidated of being in this company? They were probably too scared to mention that to me. 
And, uh, and and how about yourself? Did you ever have that feeling? Never. I never watched the way I talked to him. Never. Or could you talk to I him told the way you talked to him? I used to else? talk to him like this. I said, I can't curse on here, right? No, you can. I said, what the F was wrong with what the f was wrong with you? Are you stupid? We talk like brothers. Yeah. Who could talk to Tommy like that? Nobody. Well, that's when you know you have a true relationship. He blew out guy. my TV with a sort-off shotgun. Well, let, let me ask you a question. And now. I said, you're going to buy me a TV. $1,200 yeah. $1, back in 1980. You're going to buy me a new Zenith. And he goes, yeah, yeah, okay. Don't worry about it. I'll get it. He was a... With me, he was like a brother. Did he did he paint back then when you were I, I know no, in no, prison he's no, painting. No. Did he yeah. know he had any talent at all? Listen, like you gotta understand something, John. The guy's in jail for the rest of his life. What is he gonna do with himself? But he, he has he, talent, and from what I understand, he's not a guy like no, no, I couldn't pick up a paintbrush and start painting. He wouldn't do it unless he had He'll a throw to paint that. <laughs> Listen, I know that guy in and out. I really do. He he would never do it unless he had talent he knew in himself. And had an interest. You got to look at it this way. I know how he thinks because I was with him all, a long time. A good seven, eight years relationship we had. We're close. And then, you know, we leveled off and because he, he did his one way, I went my way. But, and that was a little my fault. But the thing is that I know how he thinks. Look where he is. What is he going to do? He's, uh, he knows he's going to be here for a long time. He wants to get along. So he's, he, he's, he's solemn. I know how he is. He's taking his outside energy because this guy's energy packed. He used to do. We used to do kung fu, Chinese kung fu together. Well, in Manhattan, you know that you said that Franco. He's trying to train me. I don't know if you know Franco was one of his next door neighbors. I mentioned them on another show. Franco's family also were made guys in the uh, Bonanno family, uh, Florida. Well, I know. I know. He would just take me around with Bobby and Frankie Lino. Yeah, house. I know Frankie, of course, but I'm talking about other guys. It was a guy, Richie and Charlie. Charlie was a skipper back then. Mm -hmm. Good guys, gentlemen, really, really nice guys. Richie was a slick, slick dresser, but Franco was very good friends with Tommy, and he used to go to Japan with him at fight, and uh, Franco was a, a, a nice guy. You know? That might have been just before I met Tommy. Yeah, and and you know, Japan. So Tommy did have friends like you and Franco that were nice guys. So there, right. I know there's an, listen, everybody I speak about, there's another side to him. That are good, you know, that are like Louis Arikio. The you know, It depends on how you know him. And guys will hate him. There's plenty of guys that hate I him. I babysit his apartment. Yeah. He had an apartment over on West uh, East 12th, around Avenue S, Avenue right. A. And he would take off and he gave me the keys and I took over for him. Well, again, you, you know, listen, here's another story I think you know of. That's how close we were. When Tommy was in prison, 91, he's with Gotti. And Gotti sends a message home, and I've talked about this, and he and Tommy asks, will I kill a kid named Dennis Harrigan for him? That was giving him up on one of the cases. So in Tommy's mind, this is La Cosa Nostra. And I got nothing personal with you, John. We're doing business. This is what we do for a living. We kill people. We have mutual friends. John's our friend. I did favors for John. John's asking me for a favor for me to kill Dennis. I want to say one thing about the, about, about the, uh, I got to watch my tapping. I want to say one thing about Tommy. There's no guy... I don't care, family, out of family, walking the earth, that's more omerta than Tommy. Yeah, well, obviously. Tommy does not talk. No, I'm only talking about him personally. Right. Everybody's got a different reason, a different situation, and that's understandable. Because you're put in a bad situation, you got reasons to do things you do, and that's common sense. But I'm just saying from a pure Italian or non-Italian, whatever your pure man's way of doing things, that's the right Right. terminology. You don't have to be Italian to be a man. You're a man, you're a man, above everything. But the thing is that he would never, ever rat anybody or hurt anybody that way. Yeah. Tommy will go down with the ship yeah. and sink. That's how he is. Well, again, listen, you know him on, on a different platform than the rest of us. Of course, that's why I, I want that and to I, be and said. I, and, 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 you know, and I appreciate you saying it because I want people to understand because my show is about uh, people, human beings, and how such a guy, a good guy, not the bad guy that we talk about. I'm talking right. about the good guy, the guy you're you're representing now, the guy that if somebody knew him a different way and maybe had an opportunity to be in a, in, in a huge corporation or in another position in his life and got involved in, in, in more so with martial arts as a teacher or something, he wouldn't be spending the rest of his life in jail. I so it's you know some bad choices mm -hmm. puts a, a good guy in a bad situation. Absolutely. I want to tell you a quick anecdote. Here's an example of how, what a nice guy he was. When I was younger, I, my father had an insurance business. Multi, I'm talking about 1978, million dollar business. That's big, that's like day, five million. 
And I didn't have the license. My older brother had it. And I didn't get along with my old brother my whole life. And my brother walked in. My father passed away from, uh, from leukemia at a young age, 61. So what happened was I had to get the license so I could at least get my own business going. Do you know Tommy? I tried to take it, and I, and I when I was younger, like 20, 18, 19, tried it, and I failed. Passed, didn't pass it. When I was with Tommy, or we were together hanging out, he sat down with me. He said, you could pass this test. He said, you're a smart guy. Sit down, concentrate. Don't come out of the house. Don't worry about it. You know, but anybody bothers you, I tell them, stay away, leave it alone. Do you know he got me to pass that test? And I had a business for 20 years. That's what kind of guy he, part of him it was like. Tommy had a very, very, uh, very uh, dark side, as we all know. Very deep and dark. But then he had another part of him. And, and it was a very, very warm guy. And as we go on in the show, a little while, I'll tell you more about him when we had that talk in the in this bedroom, because he was a good guy. I, the funny thing is that I had this trouble with my brother, and I had to get rid of some of my things. I says, can I leave them with you, and we'll put them under your bed? And he says, I got to ask my parents first. Well, I'm going to tell you that you bring up... I got to ask my parents but, uh, first. But I'm going to tell you... you have, That's what kind of respect this guy had. For you guys that are listening out there, listen. Franco said he loved his parents, and his parents were good people. Franco did say his Kathy mom and dad. And Kathy and John. That yeah, was his parents. You know, he had very good parents. And Uncle Freddie. Uncle Freddie was uh, yeah. around the Colombo family. And, and, and again, so the kids that are out there, no one comes from a perfect family situation. But, but mm -hmm. you know, some families, you know, you, you know when kids, I, hate, I don't like when kids use an excuse because I try not to use an excuse for my life. I did what I did. Tommy did what he did. Other people did what they do. Nobody has a perfect family situation, but he had good parents. I try. I want everybody to know that I tried... This may sound funny. I'm not trying to sound like I'm an angel. But I tried to help Tommy when I was in a relationship with him because I love people. I tried to loosen him up a little bit. I tried to calm him down. Try to make him you know, make him a little bit a little easier going, open him up in a different perspective of his personality. And I think a lot of it I helped him quite a bit when we were together. Because Tommy didn't get into the into the things and trouble. I told him I was against drugs. Carlo himself, when I was in Gargiulo's on Wednesday nights, I used to eat there when Carlo was there, and I'll just leave it like that. Gargiulo's are still open. Right. The Russo. Well, I knew the Russo yeah. brothers through my father because my father had an insurance business, right. and he insured all the clubs throughout New York State. He had the largest, at the time, brokerage in New York State. And he insured everybody and everything. And he insured that place, and we'd eat there Wednesday nights, and Carlo was at the table. Carlo Gambino had a little table. He was the man. Did you ever meet Carmine Lambadoza, now that you said Carlo? <laughs> Carmine Lambadoza. Carmine Lambadoza was my gombada. He's my son's godfather. Oh, really? That's my closest guy in the world to me. Okay. That's, that's I met. He's one of my friends. He was. I mean, he Car away. Car he I is, spent every. I think about 91, 92. Carmine and we spent every Christmas Eve together. Yeah, he's he was godfather, one of my I friends. I mean, we had 15 years we spent together until the time of his uh, death, which Carmine died the natural death in his living room. Yeah. Watching television. Hey, he knew how to make money. So for people who don't know, he was probably one of the biggest earners in uh, the Gambino family. Can I, can I, John, can I interrupt you, please? Yeah. All due respect, the largest earner ever yeah. of the Gambino crime family. And I don't know, how about this? I know. What... And, uh, and, uh, and, and I, I love that man. A stellar, he's my number one friend at the time. He was a stellar individual. He's the old school guy. He, if he gave you his word and he liked you, I mean, I, to me, he treated me like I was his son. That's how much he well, loved he me, and I loved to, him. He went up to Appalachian, and Vito Genovese wanted to hit him. He was the guy running through the, running yeah, through the forest. Yeah, he wanted to hit him. For people that don't know the history of that, over the stock market and him, uh, you know, investing money for other Carlo families. always protected him. Carlo yeah, Gabino. Yeah. He was well-liked, you know, big earner. And, uh, you know, he was I, like this with Carlo. Yeah, I, like I know. This. That's why I asked you when you brought it up. Yes, well, I know. Carlo, Carlo liked me because I was about 17. And I, I honestly, I, I don't like drugs. I don't like them today because I think that's part of the thing that ruined the, the families. One hundred percent. I you was know? I was big in the drug business. No, like listen, all... John. John, you and a million other guys. Yeah, that's right. So I, I'm not here to put anybody down. I'm only talking for myself. But I'm in agreement with you. It's one of the downfalls. Of, it's of, a John. It's an attraction. It's a law. There's big money in it. Everybody knows that. The cartels are doing it. The government's doing it. I'm not trying to sound like I'm better than anybody else. He said the government's doing it, not me. <laughs> Just get that on right. Listen, listen. No, listen. 
It's it's common knowledge. How about the Reagan era when they get they did arms for money with Iran? What, Oliver North. So I'm not putting the government. I'm just I'm only stating facts that are true. See what happens when I'm good at politics. I remember everything. This is common knowledge. What I am trying to say is for me personally, I don't like them. I've seen what they've done on a personal level to people. I know what it does to the families. I know what it does. To, it's it's a bad. It's a, what did they say in Godfather One? That's the second best movie of all time. The first one for me was the greatest story ever told. Yeah. But the second one was Godfather. I don't care what they say, Godfather Two with De Niro. Godfather One, that guy made a masterpiece. Uh, and what do they say in that my movie? It's a dirty business, uh, 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 Marlon Brando said. Yeah. And he was right. He knew what he was talking about. And I had this conversation. Tom with, Hayden. I had this conversation. Like great, great lawyer. I had this conversation with Carmine, the doctor. That was his nickname, the yeah. doctor. Yeah. And I got to tell you a story about that. Oh, yeah. Carmine's nickname is Doctor. The King of, I, I think they call him King, of, the King Wall of Wall Street. Street. Yeah. And here's something else. What a and sharp I guy. Sharp I mean, obviously, you know this for the people out there to know. His nephew is? Danny Marino. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people don't Danny's know Danny's a stellar guy. See, these are all people. They're, 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 I picked them. Well, he had. Let me tell you some other Danny's things Danny's you. another stellar he, guy. He, he, here's the problem. Here's not the problem. These are men. These are class these guys. Are, these are real gangs from the old days. And these the are, problem these is are guys deal. like me that are coming up and I watch Carmine. And he's got a Rolls Royce, and he's got a yacht, and he lives in Mill Basin. How many and, times I was in that Rolls Royce? Yeah, and, and you know, you're impressed with you're watching this guy. And he's got a swagger, and you know, he's an older gentleman, really. When I start seeing him, right? And uh, he's got everything you want as a young. He lasted kid. It's, pretty it's good a for him. Uh, uh, I, mean, I, I think he was 79 when he passed away. Yeah, Almost yeah. 80 years old. Listen, I did a lot of things. I forgot to buy right? a Rolls Royce. So he's yeah, he had a good life. Let me tell you a funny, I'll tell you the quick anecdote I was going to tell you. So we're sitting on Christmas Eve. I used to dress up as Santa Claus to come over. And I, and I used to walk in, I, I don't know why, you know, you, hey, maybe this guy's coming here to do something bad, dressed up in his outfit. I said, he says, come on, do you know it was me? He goes, yeah, I know it was you. I said, how do you? By your walk. He said, I know your walk. So anyway, so we're talking at the bar. Come on, had a beautiful home, gorgeous home. So I said, so I said, we were talking and this and that. I said, come on. You're a fox. I said, that's why they call you the fox. And he gave me the greatest compliment I've ever got in my life. He goes, Brody. That's what he called us, Brody. That was his favorite thing. He goes, Maeve, you're the fox. He goes, I know you're a fox. He's Coming a, to a guy that age. Yeah, well, he wasn't. Listen, if you don't I mean, know we were tight. to hit you. We were tight. You got to be pretty sharp guy. He is a fox, and he got away with... Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, Vito not hitting him. And well, Vito, Vito was on him. Well, he, that wasn't the only one. How well, about the Vito, one with the... With the he well, went Vito with, pushed the agenda. How about when he got married to Arlene? Yeah. My well, son's godmother. I think that was... Uh, that was... Uh, that was another maid guy's captain's yeah, yeah, daughter. They made him get divorced and marry her, yeah. And and, calm, and, 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 and there was a problem also with the FBI agent yeah. thing. That was and, Rufacci's... And he, did you know he said? He said, your brother's got to go? Yeah. He says, my... No, he told, he told Carlo. My brother goes... Take me too. And Carlo wouldn't do it to him. Yeah. That time he was very, very close. Yeah, I know he was. You know, he was he was considered the biggest crew ever. You Even know why I got a lot of these stories from, from Did you know that, John? Know. Yeah, I do. And and I got a lot of these stories back. Actually, I knew a lot about Kami from my friend who was his godfather also, but from Fat Andy Ruggiano. Because at the time, obviously they were friendly. He knew, you know, and he gave me a lot of stories about him. I gave me a lot of stories about a lot of guys, but he was one of them. And then later on, you know, I meet him a couple. John, of times. let me say this: I, I didn't have put myself in that group, that world. I had a small circle, and I stuck with my small circle because I was wise enough growing up. I had a good teacher, my father, who was a very big business guy, and he was as big as mob leaders. He wasn't, but he was as big as the mob leaders or bigger. They came to my father for favors. That's how big my my father kept Joe Colombo's son out of the Vietnam War. Really? I could say it now. It's 40, what, 43 years later, 50 yeah. years later. Yeah. My father was a was a, uh, a federal agent in the sense that he was a head of the uh, uh, appealing agent for, for Brooklyn for the Vietnam War. So he had an office in Coney Island, uh, I think. Uh, you know, I always throw a shout out to our veterans, and I'll do it again today. And my friend, my buddy, Brian Basho. Brian, and uh, these guys I got, and I say it all the time, I'll say it today since you mentioned Veterans and you know, you know the armed forces. These guys are, uh, are 
true guys that I'm always speaking. The of, armed forces so. are, are the best, the first responders. I agree with you, John. Yeah. But I'm just telling you stories that I grew up with as a kid that happened that I that I know about. And Carmine was very close with me, and uh, we we did we went through a lot of things together.